Welcome dear students to learning chemistry is easy and fun. Lesson number 8 we are talking about the stability of coordination compounds. Before we talk about the stability of coordination compounds you need to understand the simple logic behind the formation of a coordination complex. When we have the central atom which is a transition metal usually and it is in solution, you start adding the uh, ligands to it. So for example, I took the example of nickel chloride yesterday. So nickel chloride, when you start adding water to it, it starts forming a, it turns into a complex ion. When you're talking about the metal atom over here, the charged metal ion, right, to be more specific, it is not existing in isolation in the solution. What is there is, it is surrounded on all sides by the solvent molecule or by the oppositely charged ion. So let's suppose I'm talking about nickel chloride, then it will be surrounded by the negative ions of chloride, right? When we start adding the ion which becomes the ligand, the ligand now displaces the solvent molecules or the oppositely charged ions in the solution and takes their place, giving us the metal ligand complex which is our complex ion over here, right? So we have depicted this as saying metal ion surrounded by solvent molecules, metal ion surrounded by the ligands. So in effect, this is a substitution reaction and would be something analogous to the sub substitution reactions in organic compounds. When we talk about the stability of a coordination compound, we talk about two types of stability. The kinetic stability. Now kinetic is a term which you have used in physics very often. Something which is related to speed. Kinetic stability talks about the speed, the rate at which the ligand complex is formed or the rate at which the ligand displaces the solvent molecules in the solution in order to form the complex ion. The other stability is the thermodynamic stability. Thermodynamic stability means whether the process is spontaneous or not. That means we talk about in terms of free energy, whether the process takes place on its own or not. So let's discuss the kinetic stability first and then the thermodynamic stability. While I change the notes on it on the board, Please copy them down so they become your, yes, notes for ready reference. Now the substitution of the solvent ions by the ligand can be simply represented by means of an equilibrium reaction. Why an equilibrium reaction? Because when the forward process is taking place, the backward reaction is equally possible in this process. So we have depicted over here the metal ion being replaced by the ligands to give us the complex. Now this is a very generic equation. Let me make it more specific. We have the metal ion carrying some charge. We have the ligand carrying some charge. We have the complex ion carrying some charge on it. Right? So... We have A, B, C are the charges on the metal, ligand and the complex ion respectively, right? Because my complex ion can be positive or negative. That's why I'm depicting it simply as C. On the basis of the rate at which this substitution reaction takes place, we have divided the complex ions into labile and inert. Labile means where the process of substitution takes place extremely fast. Inert means the process of substitution takes place extremely slow. And kinetic
kinetic stability is nothing but the speed at which this particular equilibrium is achieved. The rate at which this equilibrium is achieved defines the kinetic stability of that particular process. Right? If you've noted this down, we will now go on to thermodynamic stability. Now, when we say thermodynamic stability, what comes to our mind immediately is the, yes, the free energy form, which defines the spontaneity of a process. When delta G, that is the Gibbs energy or free energy or Gibbs free energy with whatever term you know it as, if it is less than zero, the process is spontaneous. Equal to zero, equilibrium greater than zero the process is non-spontaneous that means it does not proceed towards in the forward direction now where does this delta g all of a sudden come into the picture we are talking about an equilibrium reaction over here equilibrium reaction means equilibrium constant and what is the relation between delta g and equilibrium constant yes Delta G is minus 2.303 RT log of KC. If you are clueless about this particular expression, please refer to the topic thermodynamics on the channel. Now, equilibrium constant is a term which is used to uh, define or give the expression for the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of reactants each raised to the power of their coefficients. Because we are talking about stability, we are just going to manipulate this Kc to Ks, which in some texts is also written as beta. That is stability constant. What is stability constant? Again, it is nothing but equilibrium constant for this substitution of the solvent molecules by the ligands. That's all. Okay? There's not a big deal about it. If you know chemical equilibrium, you'll understand this. So that is the concentration of the complex ion divided by the concentration of the metal ion and the ligand raised to the power of the coefficient here. My ligand, N ligand. So if let's suppose you have um, uh, Cu, H2O, O5. So there are five ligand atoms, molecules in this. So it's 5 H2O. So this 5 comes as the power over here. Now in this particular expression, how do we define thermodynamic stability? That means the what value of Ks will give us a high value of this product. Yes, higher the value of Ks, more the value of the complex ion, hence greater is the thermodynamic stability of this particular equilibrium reaction, right? That is how we define thermodynamic stability. Now, when we are talking about a substitution reaction, it's not that the entire substitution will take place in one step. It's a step-by-step -step process. So when I said CuH2O whole 5, there are actually 5 steps involved in it. So replacement of one sulfate by one water. Replacement of second sulfate by second water, replacement of third sulfate by third water and so on. Generally, we have depicted it like saying the metal plus the ligand. Now, if you notice over here, I am not showing the solvent molecule again for the sake of simplicity. What you have to keep in mind is here, it's not the metal ion existing on its own. What is there is the metal ion is surrounded by solvent molecules. So, one solvent molecule replaced by the ligand gives us the first intermediate. Now, again, this is an equilibrium reaction. So, K1, that is the stability constant for the first equilibrium is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. Go on to the second step. ML 
plus L where the second ligand replaces the second molecule of the solvent. So I have K2 is ML2 dividing by concentration of ML into the concentration of the ligand. Same way third, fourth, fifth, sixth depending upon how, how many ligands are surrounding the central metal. All in all, we can depict the relation between the stability constant and the equilibrium constant for each of the successive steps as saying that this Ks or as I said many of the texts it is depicted as beta is simply the product of the equilibrium constant for each of the successive steps in the drip, in the substitution of the solvent ions by the ligand atoms. So we have Ks is equals to K1 into K2 into K3 and so on and so forth. But why are we studying all this? How does it help? Right? What is the logic behind it? Most of it is very clear from here. But still we will deal with it in detail. Then now I've been talking about stability constant, right? So Ks is my stability constant, right? Ks or beta. What would be the reciprocal of this? So if I'm talking about the conversion of the complex ion into the metal and the ligand. Yes, what is happening here? Yes, dissociation. And dissociation means what constant would you call the reciprocal of this? Just flip it upside down. Yes, it would be called as a dissociation constant. Right? So your dissociation constant is reciprocal of stability constant. If stability constant defines the feasibility of a process in the forward direction, the dissociation constant will define its feasibility in the backward direction, right? So now let us see the applications of this stability constant. Now what is the whole logic behind studying the stability constant or the dissociation constant, right? So in general, we say stability constant is the concentration of the complex ion divided by the concentration of the metal and the ligand. So if I know the stability constant, I am able to predict the stability of a complex ion. Very obvious. So for example, we've got two complex ions of copper with the different ligands, right? So we've got the CN group here. We've got the NH3 group over here. The stability constants for the reaction wherein we've got a copper ion, the ligand can be CN negative or NH3, gives us the complex. So if you notice both of them are tetra, so that is why I've written as a generic formula. Now in each of these equilibrium reactions, the stability constant for the first one, first reaction involving CN is 2 into 10 to the power 37. And for the second one, it is 4.5 into 10 to the power 11. So, copper forms more stable complex ions with which ligand? C or NH3? Yes, it is CN because the stability constant is higher over here. So, this particular study of the stability constant gives us certain general ideas. The complex ion shows greater stability when the metal ion has a smaller ionic radius. So it is able to pull the ligands towards itself more strongly. It has a higher oxidation state. The stability constant or stability of the complex ion is also supported when the ligand has a chelating effect with a whiz if it is a monodentate ligand. So for example, if I 
take the complex of copper with ammonia and I take the complex of copper with ethane diamine, ethane 1 to diamine. So if I have ammonia, this is how the complex would be, right? CuNH3O4. If on the other hand, I have a, yes, we take the example of ethane 1 to diamine. So let me draw the structure. So I have copper and ethane 1 to diamine means CH2, CH2 and we have NH2, NH2. The donor atoms are nitrogen, NH2, NH2. CH2, CH2. Now if you notice over here, they formed a ring over here. This particular type of complex ions are found to have greater stability constant as compared to the monodentate ones. So we say ligands which can show chelating effect give us more stable complexes. The ring size. Now here I've got a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Usually, five-membered rings, if they are saturated, are found to be more stable. Six-membered rings, if they have unsaturation, are found to be more stable. So these were reasonings. If you remember, we had damped them or covered them under the heading ligands as well. So these type of generalizations can be given with the help of the study of stability constant. Although there are exceptions many a times. The ligand if it is big but at the same time it does not have any steric hindrances. If there are not large groups present on it. Even then it supports the stability of the complex ion or the complex molecule. That is why we find that the protein structures contain a lot of these combinations, the metal, the uh, donor and the acceptor uh, combinations, which you will study under biology. These are called as the macrocyclic effects. So the various factors which affect the stability of a coordination compound can be deciphered or can be decided on the basis of the value of the stability constant, right? This brings us to the end of the stability of coordination compounds. We are yet to do, yes, we have not touched base on isomerism and that's our next heading for this particular topic. Stay tuned, stay happy.